Hello, welcome to the EPG Partshala program in linguistics. I am Professor Ravinder Gargesh from the Department of Linguistics, University of Delhi. The third module of linguistics stylistics is titled Foregrounding Language Functions and a Model for Poetic Analysis. In this module, we will look at the concept of foregrounding, the functions of language and the poetic function, text reader dynamics, and text as a multi-layered phenomena for analysis. And that would be our model. This is in light of what we had done in module one and module two. We are continuing the discussion. This discussion is necessary because you should know how stylistics has become relevant, how literary language has been included. It is not all of a sudden. There is a span of 90 years, 80 years that have been going on and things have come to this state that linguistic stylistics has become a very important discipline. The objectives of the module is to introduce you to the concept of foregrounding. You already know what defamiliarization was, so there's a change. Second, functions of language. What are the functions of language? Does literature form a part of the, any one of those functions? Is there something called poetic function? And then, if there is a poetic function, how do we identify the poetic function? And finally, can we build up a model for analysis of a text? For the time being, we will restrict ourselves to poetic text and uh, the other forms will be taken up later. We have already made the point that a grammatical analysis falls short of literary understanding. For what a grammatical analysis will give us only grammatical structures of a text, not the artistic meaning. We will not get the aesthetic communication. While a grammatical analysis has a prerequisite of linguistic competence, that is a proper understanding of literary text would require a pre uh, prerequisite of a literary competence. To understand literature, we need to have a literary competence. Simple linguistic competence will not be enough. Linguistic competence is enough to understand language structures and language, but not artistic facts. For that, we need another level of competence, which we call linguistic competence. The present module will highlight the concept of foregrounding as well as that of the poetic function of language. The poetic function is semiotically oriented. We will talk about the semiotically oriented multi layered phenomena, which will be the model that we will finally propose for all poetic analysis. Even this model will be transformed into the analysis of novel and the analysis of drama later. So, coming to the literary language, you have already you already know that defamiliarization was a term used by Russian formalists. One of the scholars in the Russian formalist school was Roman Jakobson. And then he shifted to Prague, where there was a Prague school of linguistics, Prague school of functional linguistics. They looked at language in a different way. They also tried to incorporate literature into linguistic studies. In that sense, there is a direct relationship between defamiliarization and foregrounding of the Prague scholars. While defamiliarization was used by the formalists in relation to the effect of a device resulting from, a, from its function in the text, the focus was on device. But the Prague school, for them, they distinguished between dominant and automatized factors too, but in a very different way. They look at uh, text as a system composed of interrelated and interacting elements. It is not two different things, ordinary language uh, and poetic language, no, it's something different. They look at interrelations within the text. Now the focus is changing from comparison to what is within the text, an intrinsic approach is coming up. The Prague scholars were the first to talk about poetic or literary function of language. The Russians didn't talk about the function. And in the process, they made a distinction between cognitive and expressive or poetic function. Cognitive function is we understand language in different ways and the poetic function or literary function means a function of language 
that explains to us, that makes clear to us, or rather that makes us understand literary text with all its complications and aesthetics. <clears throat> the poetic function is manifested when its expressive aspect is dominant. That is when language deviates from the normal forms of language by means of certain devices, then the act of expression is thrust into the foreground. By using devices to bring language to the foreground is foregrounding. To bring something to the foreground so that we look at it afresh, that is foregrounding. Mukravaski, one of the major proponents of the Prague school, he used the term actuali sase, for foregrounding. For him, the function of poetic language consists of maximum of foregrounding of an utterance. It is not used in the services of communication, but in order to place in the foreground the act of expression, the act of speech. What does this mean? Foregrounded language is not for communicating, is, is for com literary communication only. It's not used for ordinary communication. It is used for literary communication, makes the literary language special. Foregrounding in language occurs when an unexpected usage suddenly forces the listener or reader to take note of the utterance. When something strange, strange language appears before the reader, the reader's mind is attracted to those utterances. Foregrounded occurs, foregrounding occurs when elements are raised from their functional roles to a position of unexpected prominence. When structures become unexpected, then they attract our attention. Those are foregrounded expressions. The usual prominence not only foregrounds the linguistic elements, but at the same time helps the reader also. The reader also, it helps the reader to break out from the ordinary conventional signs. It helps the readers to get out of the prison house of language. Ordinary language is like a prison house. We break the prison house and look at creativity in language and how this creativity gives fresh meanings. Ordinary language signs are subverted and we have a system which focuses attention on the signs itself rather than on the purpose. The foregrounded signs for Prague scholars, they serve as an identificatory purpose. It's an identificatory purpose also for the recognition of aesthetics. So we use them as for recognition of aesthetics. Just like the Russian school had used defamiliarization for identifying literariness, the Prague scholars are using foregrounding to identify the poetic function, the aesthetic function. The Prague scholars introduced formalism into a much larger field of signification, of semiotics, which the formalists were not doing. For Bukharovsky, everything in the work of art and in its relation to the outside world can be discussed in terms of sign and meaning. Aesthetics can be regarded as a part of the modern science of science. Aesthetics is very much part of the science of science. And linguistics is related to science of science, the study of science of science. This means that aesthetic aspect of language operates as a valid function within a total system of communication. Through this, the Prague scholars were not only able to insist on specific properties of the poetic text, but they were able to recognize links with the author also, links with the society also. So unlike what the Russian formalists were doing, their, their interpretation is much more, much more inclusive. For them, the poetic function is not exclusive, exclusively in the form of poetry or literature, but can be, can be present in to varying degrees in any verbal communication. This is an important point. For Russian formalists, literariness resided in the difference between ordinary and poetic language. For the Prague scholars, the aesthetic function predominates, it dominates the language of literature, but it can also be present in ordinary language, though to a much, much lesser degree, but definitely it is in ordinary language too. So all the functions of ordinary language will be in literary language, 
all the functions of literary language will be in the ordinary language also. <clears throat> the Prague School theory is quite comprehensive. They talk about the dominant. Which is the dominant? There has to be one dominant. The aesthetic dimension, the aesthetic function is dominant in literature. It is not dominant in ordinary language. It is submerged. So it is in that sense that we look at the aesthetic function. Roman Jakobson, who was collaborated with both the Russian formalists and the Prox scholars, he furthered, he further improved upon this language-centered perspective. He brought a semiotic perspective to it. He does not oppose the Prague school concept of literary text as a functional structure, but he insists as a linguist, the difference between poetic and non-poetic text can be explained purely in linguistic terms. This he agrees. For him, poetics deals primarily with the question of what makes a verbal message a work of art. How does verbal message become work of art? This is the concern of Roman Jakobson. You can find out formal distinctions between poetic and non-poetic, but his concern is what makes it, what makes this language artistic. And he says this perspective is an integral part of linguistics. This is reference to closing statement, linguistics and poetics, in uh, the book Style and Language by edited by Sibyok. This is a classic article which you all must read. So Jakobson makes a very strong claim for the relevance of linguistics to literary studies. And hence, stylistics also comes into it as the specialized subdiscipline of linguistics. Now, the Prague School scholars had explained the difference between literary and non-literary structures through the concept of function, not through diff structural differences, but through function. And Jakobson, in his closing statement, the article I just referred, he builds his statement first on a set of categories proposed by Mukhravsky, and then he improves upon or rather modifies the model of triadic model of Karl Buller to give a model of the functions of language within a communication paradigm. Now his model is very interesting. According to him, any communication would involve six factors. And those six factors will have corresponding six functions. What are the six factors? Any communication, oral communication or whatever kind of communication, there has to be a speaker, there has to be a hearer, of course interchange of roles, and there has to be a message communicated. Three, there's a speaker, there's a hearer, there's a message communicated, and the message is communicated in a context. So number four is context. Number five, this communication cannot become possible if the speaker and hearer are not aligned in communication. If the speaker says something and the hearer does not listen, then there is no communication. So in order to communicate, they make sure that they are one can hear. For example, you, you use the telephone. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? What is this hello? It doesn't mean the other man is deaf. It simply means you are trying to make sure that communication is going on. So there is a point of contact. If the contact is established between speaker and hearer, there is communication. And communication is in a context. And this communication takes place in a code, language. So there are six factors. One, a speaker or an addresser. Second, the addressee or the hearer. Three, there is a message to be communicated. Four, it is in some context. Five, all this is possible because of contact. If there is no contact, communication will break. And five, it is encoded in language. So these are the six factors. According to Jakobsonian theory, corresponding to these six factors are six functions of language. And the six functions are, where is the focus in the communication? On what aspect of language or what aspect of these six factors is the focus on? If the focus is on the speaker, 
the addresser then we have the emotive function what does this mean by focus on the speaker means language used by the speaker which tells us about the speaker his state of mind may be oh i have a bus to catch oh i'm getting late what does this tell us about it tells us about the speaker it tells us gives us information about something happening to the speaker so such use of language where the focus is on the speaker the function is emotive function when the function is on the hearer for example giving a command go and close the door and the second person the hearer will go and close the door so all kind of imperatives all kind of uh, asking the hearer to do something so these have a directive function they direct the hearer to do something so any language which focuses on making the hearer do something has a function and the function is called cognitive function cognitive function the third one the message is in a context suppose i say oh outside the room 20 boys are waiting for us this is the factual statement this is a factual statement about a context that there are it's a statement so most statements are contextual statements they tell us what is the reality what are the facts that is three so focus on the facts gives us a referential function focus on the kind of language that is that is used as like declaratives the function is the referential function we get reference to facts then we as i mentioned we talk to each other to establish contact telephone is one and when we meet, meet each other we say good morning and if the other person answers good morning there can be communication if one person says good morning the other person turns away the face or does not answer there can be no communication so for communication there has to be a contact so any language used for this contact has a function it is called phatic function the phatic function of language consists of function which focuses on language used for establishing contact between speaker and hearer then the language has is coded we have uh, what we said the code now if we use language for language if we use language if we focus on the code code is language if we focus on the code then we use language for language what does it mean for example all linguistics is focusing on language language is the domain of all linguistic studies any definition of morpheme any definition of phoneme or sentence any definition that you take all those definitions tell us something about the code so these definitions this language about language has a function and this function is metalingual function so linguistics has a metalingual function of talking about language focuses on the code focuses on the language so these are the six functions of language according to roman jacobson and in a communication there is always the dominant the sixth one i have to say the sixth one is the message when focuses on the message for message sake when the focus is on the message for the message sake not for any other function it has no purpose it is not cognitive it is not emotive it is not referential it is not phatic it is not metalingual it is a focus on the message for message sake to focus on the message to make it unique foregrounded then the function is poetic function so poetic function is when the focus is on the dominant when the poetic function is dominant when the focus is on the message for message sake emotive function function exists when the dominant focus is on the speaker cognitive function exists when the focus is on the hearer referential function when the focus is on the facts phatic function the when the focus is on the language of the language that uh, brings the two speaker and hearer put them in line so that they are the communication can take place 
so that they are they understand the communication they are ready for communication so that language photophatic function and language about language is but a lingual function so focus on message for message sake has the poetic function there could be many examples i could give you about this now what is the poetic function because the poetic function is a very special function <clears throat> in an, and we know that in an act of communication all functions may be present whether it's ordinary language or whether it's even literary language has all functions in literary language the poetic function dominates in ordinary language the other one of the other five functions will dominate depending upon the context if the poetic function is dominant we've said that it is poetic function the aesthetic use of language justifies it becomes distinct due to the self consciousness nature of the art of the of the language of literature that is the language of literature draws attention to itself and not for any purpose its own nature so the patterns of sound the syntax they are intrinsic to the text they are attracting attention into the text so that we are forced to look at the text and interpret the text so the poetic function roman jacobson defines poetic function in a very technical way he says the poetic function projects the principle of equivalence from the axis of selection into the axis of combination equivalence is promoted to the constitutive device of sequence what does this mean very famous statement poetic function projects the principle of equivalence from the axis of selection into the axis of combination what does this mean of course this distinction means there is a selection process and there is a combination process there is a syntactic process there is a paradigmatic process from paradigmatic level we make choices and we put them into syntactic relationship the syntactic relationship may be foreground may result in foregrounded language so we can create through through syntactic relations we can take such expressions that the sentence becomes very different for example we can say we generally say oh he was here a minute ago oh i did this one month ago oh one month one year ago we did this so it's a normal sentence it's a normal sentence but if one says something like if one say if someone says something like a grief ago a grief ago is no expression but we know that grief belongs to one category category of experiences category of emotions whereas month week minute they are temporal dimensions so when we make sentences we choose paradigmatically a ago now within ago we can see a minute ago a second ago a year ago a decade ago temporal words come but in literary language this kind of strict categorization is is destroyed the categories are made broad even experiential categories are introduced so you can say a grief ago you can say a smile ago so this language becomes very different this is a kind of foregrounded language so such language evinces the poetic function this is what principle of equivalence uh poetic function projects the principle of equivalence what is made equal grief is made equal to time grief which does not exist this structure is not is not uh, acceptable in uh, in ordinary language but in literature this equivalence is done in a very specific manner from the paradigmatic level we bring it into one syntax and we make things equal we have made non temporal things with temporal things resulting in a new structure a foregrounded structure so such structures evins poetic function so this is the way roman jacobson goes about it now there is a problem with roman jacobson's analysis i will we will give you one reference and you should go and read that reference roman jacobson had analyzed many poems if you look at his analysis there is an analysis of shakespeare sonnet also in english of french poem he has done many poems he has done russian poems he has done if you look at the kind of analysis he does he looks at grammatical patterns patterns of similarity 
patterns of similarity give us patterns of sounds sounds which are similar like alliteration like similar vowels like assonance similar sounding consonants like consonants rhymes all kind of structures grammatical structures syntactic structures he looks at all these structures and sees where one structure is like another how one structure is repeated the repetition of structures the parallelism between the structures he relates it to as identification of poetic function now to identify poetic function with only repeated structures this was a problem this is his theory but subsequent scholars like jonathan color like many other scholars what they have done is they found that such grammatical parallelisms occur not only in poem it occurs in a random cutting of a newspaper so if grammatical parallelism is in a random cutting of a newspaper it doesn't make that news makes that newspaper item a poem so there were problems with roman jacobson's theory and uh, scholars after roman jacobson or even his contemporaries looked at this problem and they said yes there's a problem with this pure grammatical pure structural analysis cannot give us the poetic function it can lead to some kind of identification but nothing more there may be features which may be non not relevant and yet we say these are very important so how to get over this problem this problem was got over by bringing in the reader it is the reader who knows what structures are important what structures are not important where the language is rich where the language is uh, more uh, uh, let's say concentrated so they the readers know where to put the finger where to find out that from here we have more material which will more signs more rich sign which lead us to interpretation rifat air was one such scholar he criticized jacobson's method of analysis and he was among the first to use the concept of the reader of course the reader was a limited person for him a reader was a man a person let's say who would read a poem let's say and point out that these are the important structures then the linguist who is a stylist or stylistician he will pick up from the cues of the reader that these are important structures and he will theorize he will see how the meaning comes about those the stylistician is not the man who identifies the structure they are identified by somebody some other reader this was the first part subsequently we have scholars like uh, uh, stanley fish like uh, roman in garden like eiser like yaus they give more creative power to the reader it is the reader who identifies the structures and stanley fish made the stylistician the linguist as the supreme leader it is the linguist who identifies what are important what is the how we go about interpreting meaning and the society will follow he lays down the standards he is the right person to do it and others follow him so that's one of the more extreme approaches that stanley fish gave anyway the idea is that the meaning of the text the poetic function is fine grammatical analysis alone will not help so we need the co-creative activity of the reader to get the meaning of the text so the meaning of the text is realized by the aesthetic sensibility of the reader the reader has literary competence it is with the literary competence that the reader reads the text and makes meaning out of it and two readers any three readers their meanings can be different but nonetheless there could there will be a common core of interpretation so any reading can give a new dimension depending upon the world view of the reader it is the reader who creates meaning from the text by filling in the blanks which are not clear wherever the blanks are he puts in his own meaning she puts her own meaning and we have a concretization of the sense of the text so there is a co-creative activity of the reader plus the language of the text the two put together gives us a good level of stylistic analysis now how does the reader now do this we come to the last part how does the reader do this the reader looks at the text as a multi-layered phenomena susan langer a philosopher of language she had made a distinction between 
the art symbol and symbols in art. She had talked about the literary text as the art symbol and the various images and uh, metaphors and uh, other phenomena which are part of it. He, she considered them as symbols in art. And the symbols in art together form the art symbol. Now symbols in art forming the art symbol was her conceptualization. She was looking at meaning. If we look at it more linguistically, where does the meaning come from? Where do the symbols come from? The sentence symbol, the symbols are not, symbols in art are not symbols from, from the sky. They have language as the base. So we need to put a linguistic basis to symbols in art and the art symbol. So the proposal was first given by Srivastava, then followed by many of us and developed further. The proposition is that we look at a text as a multi-leveled phenomena. The lowest level is the level of language, where we need linguistic competence. Without linguistic competence, we cannot identify structures. We do not know what are the patterns of structures. So in order to identify patterns of uh, sounds, patterns of words, patterns of sentence structure, we need, a, we need sentences. We need a competence about sentences. So we talk about a lower most level called the level of the sentence symbol. So these sentence symbols are sentences, sounds, words, they have meaning, they have common meaning, they have denotative meaning, ordinary meaning. So any poem can be understood in terms of ordinary meanings. Any poem can be understood in terms of ordinary meanings. But as a specialized meaning, we need to look at the poem in another way. We need to look at the poem in another way. These languages, these uh, sounds, words, sentences, they are input into something higher level. They become signs. They become how they become signs of connotation. They begin to have meanings different from the ordinary meaning. Because the symbols now function in a literary competence, we need another kind of competence. If we use linguistic competence to study the language, we know the patterns. Significant patterns can be called style patterns. So stylistic patterns or style features are identifiable linguistically. But the function is much more. When we look at, when we look at the same language with a kind of communicative competence, if we look at the language with a communicative competence, then some meanings become different. The same language communicates differently. For example, a violation of selection and restrictions between subject and object could be the defining criteria for a metaphor. We can have a metaphor. The sea, the, the ship plows the waves. Okay, the ship plows the waves. How can a ship plow the wave? Well, there is a violation of selection restriction between ship and waves and plowing. What plows is a hoe, not a ship. So there is a violation of selection restrictions which define a metaphor. This metaphor is identifiable at linguistic level, but the function is communicative. So at the communicative level, we know that it means something different. And that meaning emerges. The structures are seen as symbols, as different level signs, as second order signs, where communicative meanings come into effect, where the meanings become different. They are not linguistic meanings anymore. They become meanings in connotation. Words, they begin to have connotations at second level. Then we have a third level. These symbols in isolation, they come together in, an, in a network. They get interrelated to each other. Not in a linear order, you can look at it in any way. There's a relationship between them, interrelationship, which joins, links a symbol to another symbol and to all symbols together. And then the their own uh, significations get modified. And these significations, for modification of these significations, mere communicative competence is not enough. We need artistic competence, literary competence. If we have literary competence, we can combine these symbols together and draw the greater in, uh, communicative intent of the text, the artistic intent of the text. What is the, the text trying to say? 
So we will know the text by looking at all the symbols together as a unit, as one unit, as one unit. So this gives us a third level, the level of the art symbol. So we have the level of the sentence symbol. Look at the a text in terms of linguistic structures, identify linguistic patterns, style features, and then look at them in another way. In a community, what do they communicate? They may appear strange, but they communicate something different. So everything has to be resolved. All language has to be resolved. All language is meaningful in a poem. So we have to resolve the meaning. So we give them some meaning depending upon how we see the symbol, the sign. And then the signs can be in terms of the sound, sound symbolism, like alliteration and repetition of sounds. They can also become harsh sounds, soft sounds, musical sounds, dozing sounds, putting people to sleep, laziness. It can be sounds. It can be words, words that bring into clash many things. It could be sentences. It could be passivity, using passive, passive voice. It could be so much. I'm reminded of a Hindi song. Ham se aaya na gaya, tum se bulaya na gaya. Fasla pyar me dono se mitaya na gaya. For non-Hindi speakers, I'm sorry. But these three sentences are in the passive. Now, if you say that these structures are passive, that doesn't explain the story. That doesn't explain the meaning. The kind of pain that come emerges from the use of passive, the kind of pain that emerges can only be identified at a communicative level or an artistic level. Just by identifying that there is use of three passives doesn't doesn't uh, it doesn't complete the picture. So we need the artistic competence too, to make finer meaning of all the symbols in that put together. Then this third level has another dimension, the level of the aesthetic symbol. Aesthetic symbol involves the reader. What is the meaning of the text? The meaning of the text is not what is the text. I mean, of course it is the text, but the text is the potential. That is, it has a meaning. But every reader when the reader reads the text, make, can make a different meaning. So if we give a poem to 10 people, we could have 10 different readings. No two readings will be exactly alike. But we cannot say that any reading is wrong. All 10 readings may be valid. So the reader is involved in, in creating meaning for himself, for herself. This is the aesthetics. The reader enjoys the aesthetics is part of the reader and the text. This is called the, this level is the level of the aesthetic symbol. And we need, the function is sentience, feeling. If you feel the language, you know the meaning, you can create the meaning. So sentience function is central to the aesthetic function of language. And a reader creates the meaning by reading the text. The language of the text is very important. If a linguist, if a stylistician looks at the language of the text and compares it with the, with the observations of the readers, the concretizations of the readers, one can say which reading is more closer to the language of the text, which reading is appropriate, which reading is, they can all be allophonic, they could all be, all be correct, but there could be one which may be outlandish, which may be something very different. So one can even evaluate a, a stylistic, a literary in linguistic stylistics, we can evaluate from the language structures to symbols in art, to the art symbol and to the aesthetic symbol. By looking at language, by looking at the text at all the four levels, the stylistician can give a good analysis. So this is so far as it is. So what have we done so far? We have again begun with the idea that language needs to be studied not only grammatically, of course grammatically, but more than that, more than that. And language is rich. And in order to see the richness of language, what constitutes literature, first we had looked at the Prague School scholars' concept of foregrounding. Foregrounding means using literary devices, to bring the language, change the language in such a way that it brings it to the foreground, we begin to look at it afresh. We need to see what it is 
and look at it and, and see its communicative intent. That is the function of uh, the foregrounded language. And we find foregrounding as central to the poetic function. Poetic function is a function, it's not a purpose. All functions, they emerge from language use, whether it's emotive function, whether it's cognitive function, referential function, they emerge from language use. Similarly, poetic function emerges. And the poetic function needs to be seen as a very dynamic phenomena. The poetic function does not reside only in the language of the text. It resides in the, that is the place where it starts. But unless it is, it is read by the reader, the poetic function is not complete. The poetic function finds completion in the text reader dynamics. And when the text reader dynamics takes place, we have proposed that it takes place at four levels. We look at the text as a, as a sentence symbol. We identify linguistic structures, patterns. They are very necessary. They are the style features. And then how these style features get converted into a communicative paradigm. That's the communication uh, level, communicative competence uh, phenomena. And then this communicative phenomena becoming further intertwined, resulting in one complex entity called the text which we look at artistic symbol. So first level was sentence symbol, second level was symbols in art, where we look at the individual uh, linguistic devices as communicative, so that's the symbols in art. And the symbols in art entering into relation, into relationship, forming one unit of the text, that's the art symbol. And to know the art symbol, the stylistation, the reader must have artistic competence. So the the literary, the literary, the stylistician, linguist stylistician must have linguistic competence, communicative competence, and artistic competence. And an enlightened reader should have all the three plus aesthetic dimension, the aesthetic competence. What is, how does it, how does it mean? What does it mean to you? So how do you put the language of the text and bring your worldview into it and interpret it? So the, the uh, level of the aesthetic symbol is the level of the interpretation. So this is how in, in linguistic stylistics, we explore text. So till we explore a text, let's keep this pending.